tuning in to Riley Prince Church Podcast. It's Saturday, May 23rd of 2020, and we're glad that you're a part of our listening audience tonight. Thank you so much. We're a vibrant church in the heart of Greenfield, Indiana, planted two years ago with a mission, vision, and purpose statement, looking for ways to love. And that includes you. So thank you for taking the time to listen in. I want to give you a little bit about where we are and then the lesson for you. We have been following a series of lessons on a spiritual trail since Easter or Resurrection Sunday. As a result of that, we borrowed a theme that where the trail begins, where the sidewalk ends. The trail after the resurrection was a little more difficult, uphill. It was not clearly defined. When Christ was with the disciples, he was their ready teacher, in their presence, constantly guiding, instructing, and teaching. And after the resurrection, there were appearances, valid and true, that the trail was unique. So that's where we are. We're on a spiritual trail, the four slabs of the four Gospels, if you will, and the sidewalk are somewhat behind us, and we're moving ahead to discover, after the resurrection, the life of the church. We've even picked up a somewhat of a theme, you might have heard of this text by Shel Silverstein, where the sidewalk ends. He says in that last stanza, Shell does. Yes, we'll walk with a walk that is measured and slow, and we'll go where the chalk white arrows go. For the children they mark, and the children they know, the place where the sidewalk ends. The church, the fledgling disciples, for them the sidewalk had a clear ending. And the trail ahead would be marked with joys and difficulties. So we're taking a look at the lessons that they learned and how they grew and how this fledgling band of men and women grew to be a movement that explodes and impacted the world and turned up kingdoms and in spite of conflict, the gospel was advanced. There's a wonderful text out there, The Story of All Stories, by Karen Lee Thorpe. She highlights a little bit of where we are. This is the period after the resurrection, as a block of 40 days. And our working title tonight is, On the Eighth Day. On the Eighth Day just a minute. If you want to find your place and your device or your scripture, we will be in John chapter 20. Uh, Verse 24 is where we will begin and we'll conclude our thoughts with the 29th verse. So back to the story of all stories. During the 40 days after Jesus returned from death, he appeared frequently to groups of followers. Jesus appeared to his brother James and many of his friends and relatives, found it difficult to believe that he was the king during his former life. But seeing him back from the dead sure convinced them. He would appear and disappear almost like a ghost. But he was too solidly physical to seem like anything other than a live person. He did not do what one might expect, materialize maybe in the high priest's office or the temple courts in their regal grandeur, and demonstrate his resurrection beyond any doubt. That would have been coercion. If he'd done that, the leaders and the people would have been forced to bow to him, even though their inner commitments were unchanged. They still would not love him. If blatant 
empowered in flame, has not won the generation who saw Moses on Sinai and Elijah on Carmel. They would not win this granite-hearted bunch or band of men and women. So instead, Jesus trained his followers to present the evidence about him in such a way that it would invite a change of heart. Like the prophets before him, these apostles or sent ones would be the king's friends sent to woo a maiden on his behalf. One day he would indeed come to claim his realm by force. But in the meantime, his disciples would infiltrate enemy territory and seek recruits. That's where we find ourselves, in one of those meetings where Christ was teaching his disciples, and he would let them know that after these moments, his time here was limited like this in their presence, but he was preparing the church for life in the second phase. So on the eighth day, we're pausing to rediscover what life was like for the early church in 30 AD. The spiritual trail began, if you will, on the week to change the world. And each day of that week that changed the world paused at the epicenter of Friday. It's often referred to by different names and titles, but on this day, Friday, of Holy Week, Christ, in his passion, participated in a one-time, never-to-be-repeated act, whereby he died for the sins of the world. That is a trail marker that we have discussed Moving through the weeks and months ahead, a worldwide movement would begin. Sparked by an event on Friday, the death of Christ, and yet his resurrection on Sunday. Their early experiences offer us, the church today, instruction, guidance, vital insights for our life and health as the Church of Christ. So join me on our discussion on the eighth day. For on the first day of the week, that's exactly what John 20 and how it reads. John 20 and verse 1 with a backstory. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still even dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. That's John 20. Verse 1. That is the beginning of a powerful chapter with one individual stating they have taken our Lord out of the tomb. And then there's the 5K of John and Peter and the discussion. and It leads to so many things. And then an appearance of Christ, the resurrected Christ. On the evening of the 19th verse here, on the evening of the first day of the week, while the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Shalom be with you. They were afraid and frightened behind locked doors for a specific reason, the fear of the Jewish leaders that persecuted Christ and murdered him. Now we are on the eighth day since the resurrection experience of Christ in the 24th verse, as we mentioned. Now Thomas, called Didymus, was one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. He said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, 
and put my hand into its side. I will not believe. Now Thomas was missing or absent from the first gathering. He was one of the twelve as it's often in scripture. You will see twelve is capitalized. Though there were eleven minus Judas. Very difficult days. Eighth day in 30 AD since this epic event that changed the world. It was such an event it created a before and an after. But Thomas has stated he needs the evidence. Well, Elton Trueblood once said, faith is not the belief without proof, but trust without reservation. Thomas has a label that we could learn from here, and maybe he's been mislabeled. His doubt only lingered eight days. We're going to find a solution for that here, just like Mary Magdalene's solution for her broken heart earlier in John 20. So to verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, You might know, Shalom be with you. Peace be with you. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, Christ, put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. So Thomas was presented with the evidence that he said he needed. He could see and he could touch. And Thomas's response, this five word declaration, is in verse 28. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, this rises high above the foothills in the whole book of John as a testament to who Christ was to Thomas and also the early fledgling church. Christ was their Lord and God. And Jesus said to him in verse 29, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. This was on the eighth day, and may God add his blessing to the reading and your listening of the word of God. The eighth day is not a new concept in scripture. There are 16 verses surrounded by passages in the Bible that deal with the eighth day. Just one example. Numbers 29 and 35. On the eighth day you shall have a sacred assembly. You shall do no customary work. This dealt with the Feast of the Tabernacle. So the eighth day out was an epic moment for a brand new movement. This was a day in their life when Christ assisted Thomas with doubts. We should not refer to him as doubting Thomas, though I just did. We should refer to him as faithful Thomas, trusting without reservation. Eight days in a state is not long enough for a label, just like history might have given him. But let's look at what was happening on the eighth day and how we can learn from this. Our church today, through instruction and guidance and insight, they were together again. There's a beautiful power and a spiritual, impactful fragrance to the one anotherness of the Church of Jesus Christ. They were together. The word again is impactful. They were together again. They had moved from, I have seen the Lord, to a, we have seen the Lord. 
Their testimony was expanding, and even among their fellowship, their body, there was growth. One might ask, well, there was 11 or 12 at this point. Yet later, at Pentecost, there was 120. The church was growing. On the eighth day, there were evidences that were presented. There was also a miracle. Christ appeared behind locked doors. He navigated every obstacle to get to his church, and he still does. He also conferred a blessing on the church. But first he paused to bring them peace. Not peace as if there were no troubled days ahead. No difficulties behind them. This was a peace like a stanch or a post in the middle of their life. Immovable, rock-like peace that would sustain them. As if we're talking about Paul already, even though Paul had not written this text from Philippians 4-7. The peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. It's that essence, that peace. So seeing is believing, right? Well, that's an adage, and that's not necessarily biblical. One might say Thomas saw and he believed, but let's look a little differently. Marcel Proust has guided us with a quote. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but having new eyes. For the next few minutes as we wrap this up, let's look at this with different eyes. It's not that seeing is believing. It's believing is seeing differently. Yes, Believing in Christ is seeing the world and circumstances and conditions uniquely differently. Thomas is our example for this. We can see the five word proclamation, my Lord and my God, if you have the time and you'd like to reference it. Look at the other narrative with Jesus and Thomas in the 14th chapter of John where Thomas has a question and Jesus answers. It's just one of these beautiful verses in all of scripture in John 14 and 6. Thomas seems to have evoked John's prowess blessed by the Holy Spirit Apostle John, the writer of this gospel, gives us another beautiful rendition of Thomas's response, moved from his disbelief to his trust without reservation. And that's where we are today on the eighth day for the church. And what's our takeaway? Well, our takeaway is that Jesus Christ is God's one and only Son. God's still doing what no one else can do, and Christ is still saving people from their disbelief, providing the evidence is necessary to heal their faith journey, and they're trusting without reservation. Thomas is our example. Now signs in the book of John are miracles. We've got a miracle of faith. We've got the miracle of Jesus appearing as and when needed to strengthen the church. And he still will do the same. We've got this growth mechanism. It's there. It's an underpinning in this narrative. The I and the we of John 20. There's growth. It's powerful. We have togetherness in difficult times. And boy, the church we should continue to admit we really do need each other. In Christ's name, love is there in the mortar joints and difficulties of life. One of our last
last takeaways is we need to respond in faith and not disbelief. Thomas presented with the evidence, seeing and touching. He responded in faith, not disbelief. He responded in that powerful, my Lord and my God. And Christ said he was spiritually blessed because of his response. If you can say, Christ is my Lord and my God, then there is that spiritual blessing for you too. If you, like Thomas, are part of the believing, seeing fellowship of Christ followers, then you'll find yourself in John 20, verse 29b. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's where we are. And yet have believed. And we believe God has a plan for you. And in looking at Christ's church in 30 AD, their instructions and guidance and insights in the scripture, we can have the same faith that can grow and learn and evolve through the power of the Spirit. One last reminder. Just scripture must precede our beliefs. Our beliefs do not take precedent over the scriptures. There's evidence. It demands a response. But scripture, sola scriptura, comes first and it precedes our beliefs. And from the scripture, the evidence of God, our beliefs are formed. Faith is not the belief without proof, but trust without reservation. And we want to remind you here, and thank you for taking the time to listen in to the Riley Friends Church podcast with the title on the eighth day. Please remember that tough times don't last, but tough faith does. And may God bless you and yours in the days to come. Thank you for listening.